the pure joy of goofing around. It's not just cats and dogs that love it. A surprising number of other animals do too. When you start to consider weird sorts of behavior exhibited by lots of kinds of animals, you suddenly realize that things like play occur all over the animal kingdom. And animals will play with some unlikely friends, including us. There is something in our deeply rooted nature that is able to communicate with a whole range of life on this, on this planet. Play is deeply embedded in our nature. I have the most adaptive species in the world, we play. And we play more than any other species if we allow ourselves. And it's good for us in ways we never imagined. I actually started to read the literature, and what I read blew my mind. It turns out play has huge benefits for our brains. And if it's risky play, even better. It happened almost without anybody noticing. Over the past 30 years, outdoor play began to disappear from the lives of children in North America and Europe. Today, kids in the UK spend half as much time outside as their parents did. Technology seems to be everyone's new playmate. And it's a trend that has many experts worried especially as evidence from the animal world shows that physical play has the potential to make us smarter, braver, maybe even kinder. You ready, Cookie? You ready? Stuart Brown is the grandfather of play research. He's been promoting its benefits for more than 50 years. If you look at the overall place of play in the world of animal play, you begin to see that it is as present as sleep and dream. Brown says the instinct to play is an important part of animal evolution. So important, there's a silent language that goes with it. <laughs> when two dogs want to play, what you see is dog-dog play language. If it was aggressive and they were fighting, they'd have an entirely different body language. <laughs> That's paw slap, paw slap, which is typical play activity from a dog. Part of animal play, and part of the reason it is so compelling, is that it's pure and everybody gets it. Now look at that, play bow. You know, it's instinctive. And we're wired the same way, you know, same, same part of our brain. Brown has gathered overwhelming evidence that there's a lot more to play than exercise for the body. It's also exercise for the mind. One of the things that keeps play going that they know how to do instinctively, they will keep the play going without one dominating the other. And that is one of the essences of play. It's infectious. Here, we got four of them now. Here we go. We may recognize play in our pets, but what exactly is it? It took Gordon Burghardt to figure that out. He studies animal behavior from an evolutionary perspective. I'm uh, primarily a reptile ethologist, reptile behavior person, and I've always liked snakes and lizards and turtles. And uh, years ago, articles came out about play, and I thought, well, I never even saw anything I would consider play in a reptile. Scientists have known for a long time that mammals and birds play. Recognizing play in an animal that moves slowly is a lot trickier. 
a dog wagging its tail or monkeys or chips responding to tickling and so on. That's sort of something we can easily identify. Hey, that seems to be playful, pleasurable, fun to the animal. Uh, it's hard to do that with a turtle. So we need more objective criteria. And I came up with five different groups, I might say five criteria of, of play. To qualify as play, a behavior must be done for no apparent reason. It has to be done over and over again. Sometimes in an exaggerated way. It's spontaneous. And the animal has to be doing it when it's not stressed. Burghardt came up with his criteria after discovering reptiles are capable of play. Hi. Hi, girl. Now she's going to go back and maybe grab something in my pocket. That's what they like to do. He identified play behavior in the largest lizard in the world, the deadly Komodo dragon. They can bring down a water buffalo. It's not something many people ever get to see. Hey. Well, sometimes play is uh, confused with exploration. One of the uh, ways of telling the difference is that exploration is you're just checking out something. What you do with it is now play. Hey, girl. Oh, maybe she goes. Reptiles operate at a little slower pace than we do, but she has all the important elements. This is behavior that uh, is part of their normal repertoire. She'll do this over and over again. It's a behavior in an animal that we consider in a relaxed state. It's a behavior that's voluntary. Another confusion may be, well, maybe the animal is just stupid enough and it thinks it's food, and it's acting as if it's prey. That is clearly not the case either, because the animal doesn't try to eat the object. Hey, that was pretty good. Pretty good girl. Bye, girl. Following Burgard's lead, scientists have learned all kinds of creatures play. Even fish, it seems, enjoy an occasional game of ball. Scientists continue to be surprised, not just by which animals play, but who they play with. For instance, the giant Pacific octopus. It's generally a loner. A year ago, Seattle became this one's new home. And the place where it would meet an unexpected friend. Just watching an octopus move is so graceful and so beautiful. You can spend so much time just sitting there and watching them and just being mesmerized by the way that they move and they interact with their environment. We're here to make sure their enclosures are clean. Um, we take care of them. And so it's kind of a day-to-day -day cleaning and feeding. Then one day, a bit of housekeeping turned into something magical. It began with uh, the simple task of cleaning the windows. So 
Um, we get water droplets on the top edge of our acrylic there and we have to clean those off so that we can provide a good viewing experience for the public. And I was up there spraying it off with a freshwater hose. And the animals started to reach out of the water and kind of grab for the fresh water that was dripping down. And I was like, well, that's unusual. I've never seen that before. And so I actually just went ahead and sprayed the animal with the hose. And the animal completely went upside down and just started to come out of the water and kind of move around and hung around for a couple of minutes. I mean, there's a lot of animals that have no interest in humans whatsoever and actively swim away from you, but these animals come to us and interact with us. Each time the spraying stopped, the octopus would squirt back. And so, a game was born. What is it about play that it has the power to bridge the divide between a solitary sea creature and a human being? Type of questions that we really don't have answers to yet and show that there is something in our deeply rooted nature that has, is able to communicate in some level with a whole range of life on this, on this planet. Thanks to cell phone cameras and social media, we're seeing a lot more evidence of interspecies play. And sometimes it's between the most surprising playmates. The impulse to have fun seems to cross all kinds of boundaries in the animal kingdom. At a zoo in Germany, there's a whole community of animals renowned for playing together. Bonobos. And it isn't just the young ones who monkey around. Italian primatologist Elisabetta Palagi has come here to take a close look at this endangered species. Bonobos are our closest living relatives, and uh, they can give us a lot of information about the evolution of our behavior. She's intrigued because these animals aren't just playful, they're peaceful. Unlike other primates, they've never been known to kill each other. When two different communities of chimpanzees meet together, they normally fight. Bonobos play. Play is uh, pervasive uh, in, the, in the Bonobo society. It is uh, a vehicle to explore the world. Play creates strong bonded, and if we share strong bonded with your group mates, you have much more chance to survive and to get the resource you need. It is important for the development of social skills in youngsters because they acquire social competence. If you want to live in a social group, it is important, it is crucial that you perceive the emotion of the other. Buongiorno. Ciao. Pelagi's team is trying to figure out just how well bonobos can read one another's feelings and whether it could be the secret to how well they play together. They use avatars to get the bonobos to yawn. Yawning after you see someone else yawn is a telltale sign of empathy. Humans start doing this at around the age of four. Scientists call it emotional contagion. If you are infected by mimicking a mother action performed by group mates, you can recreate the same emotion. So it is a, an emotional linkage between subjects. 
So in the yawning video, you uh, can find avatar yawning a lot in different position, in front, uh, in, in the lateral position, diagonal position, and the animal respond. No. It can take a while, but the bonobos mimic the yawn many times during the study. Could it be their ability to read faces that enables them to get along so well? It's difficult to understand uh, if empathy is at the basis of play or play is at the basis of empathy, of the development of empathy. But we can say, and uh, we, we, we have first data that suggests us that this behavior covariates. It's a common theory that young animals play to prepare for adult life. But a possible connection between play and compassion is one of many hidden benefits science has started to uncover. It's no wonder scientists used to think play was nothing more than practice. Consider how much fun children have playing with grown-up tools. But a recent study shows kittens who play at hunting don't necessarily catch more mice as adults. Bear cubs romp in the den with their siblings, yet generally they live alone once they mature. Clearly, there's more going on than meets the eye. Jonathan Pruitt has had his eye on a particular kind of spider, the social spider, since he was a graduate student in Tennessee. I'm interested in social spiders because of these tiny little predators that no one knows anything about, really. At least normal people don't know that they're even a thing. They're spiders that work in concert to make giant webs together, capture prey together, and rear each other's offspring. And there are only about 20 species of social spider on Earth out of the maybe 50,000 species of spider that have been described so far. So it's sort of an evolutionary uh, novelty item. Pruitt and his colleagues were especially interested in a kind of dating game that social spiders play. Mature males will recruit to the webs of immature females who ha aren't mature yet, they can't mate, and these males will do their, practice their little courtship dances for the female. But then the females respond to this courtship dance by approaching the male, assuming a, a posture of receptivity, the male just puts his genitals on the outside of the female's genitals and then just sits there and over and over. There they are just attempting this copulatory posture when they could be off spending their time doing other things like getting food or laying down more silk to protect, to protect them from predators. And so I thought, oh, it's sort of like they're gaining experience for later on in life that might be pertinent, like motor skills or, or uh, social skills, social intelligence. And then later on, as I conducted more studies, I just became more and more comfortable with thinking, yeah, actually, this thing, this kind of behavior that we're seeing in a spider might just be play. Pruitt's team studied hundreds of spiders to find out why they would behave in this peculiar way. So I figured out the consequences of this behavior by manipulating these individuals' ability to engage in the behavior. I allowed some individuals to engage in almost sex in these little plastic cups, and then others that uh, were prevented from ever having those experiences. And one of the interesting things that I found is that females that had had experience engaging in play sex early on in life produced heavier egg cases later on, and that that effect scaled to how much experience they had. The more experience in play these females had, the larger their egg cases. Not only do playful females have more young, they live longer and they're less aggressive they're much less likely to kill their partners after mating, something that's common in the extraordinary world of spiders. When you start to consider weird sorts of behavior exhibited by lots of kinds of animals, you suddenly realize that things like play occur all over the animal kingdom, and that it might not be such a sophisticated thing that's endemic or unique to people or, or mammals, that it might be something that has very deep evolutionary roots.
It was in Western Canada where researchers made one of the biggest discoveries about the purpose of play. They took a close look at the behavior of young domesticated rats. Australian neuroscientist Serge Pallas explains what these animals are up to while most of us are sleeping. They're chasing after one another. One animal tries to get up to the other one's top of the neck and the other one will roll over to defend itself. And you see that they both take turns at doing this behavior. Researchers wanted to see what would happen if the young rats were raised with no one to play with. In an alternative rearing condition, we have a juvenile growing up with an adult, and adult rats don't like playing with juveniles. So they will hang around together, they'll groom one another, they'll sleep next to one another, but they won't engage in rough and tumble play that the juveniles do. Hi, honey. I know, I'm sorry. The play-deprived rats failed to develop social skills, including the ability to play normally with one another. At the end of the experiment, the brains from the play-deprived rats were closely examined. The part responsible for decision-making and impulse control was underdeveloped. So here was a set of experiments where we actually show it is play, changing the prefrontal cortex, and then all these changes we see in rats that are play-deprived is because of this change in the, in the prefrontal cortex. Not only was the prefrontal cortex different, so were the actual nerve cells. They appeared disorganized compared to regular cells. This was the biggest discovery of Serge Pallas's career, but it left him with a nagging worry. I grew up in a suburb in Melbourne, Australia, and about a mile straight down from my street was a river valley, lots of greenery, lots of slopes to tumble down, lots of places to hide, create games with your friends. It was fantastic. One of the shocking things that I found as soon as my wife and I came to Lethbridge is we saw the, the coolies, got a river valley, it looked fantastic. And the thing that shocked us both was, where are all the kids? My concern is that denying young children the opportunity to engage in play has led to them not getting the kinds of experiences that actually prepare them to be able to deal effectively in an unpredictable world as adults. There are several studies that track things like how frequent is depression in childhood, how frequent is psychopathology, and that's been going like this. So you have the play coming down like this and all these mental health things going up like this. At the University of Tennessee, researchers are taking Pellis's work a step further. They're looking into the connection between play and the ability to deal with life's hard knocks. These are Syrian hamsters. They're about a month old. And at about a month old is their peak time of social play. And their social play is rough and tumble, mock aggression, where they will roll around, pin each other, and wrestle. Oh, look at them. And one way to initiate play is when that animal approaches and rolls over on his back, and they roll into a, uh, a play fight. Well, here they go, there's a push. And you can see that one animal initially ended it, ran away, and he came back, and he attacked the other, and they switched roles. Uh, it really is play fighting. Play has several functions, but one is to allow for development of the prefrontal cortex. And so what we were interested in is their ability to cope with stress in adulthood, because we know the prefrontal cortex is important for stress coping. One normal adult has been placed into the home of another. Adults don't play at fighting, they actually fight. These animals usually live alone, so the battle can get vicious. The home-caged animal will defend its territory against the intruder and attack. So 
you can see they attack from the side, just like a, a play fight. But in adults, it's not playful, and they continue to try to uh, seriously uh, attack each other. The loser suffers what's called a social defeat. A normal hamster will get over it and go on to fight another day. And there we go. That's social defeat. OK, there you go. Okay. A play-deprived hamster that loses is less resilient. The next time it's in a fight, it will be submissive. And what we have here is a play-deprived animal uh, in his home cage, and we put in a smaller, non-threatening animal into the cage, and we allow for social interaction. And the play-deprived animals respond with a great deal of anxiety and fear. They might go and sniff the other animal and then run away. And that's our index of social anxiety. And play-deprived animals show an exaggerated social anxiety after a trauma compared to the animals that had normal social play growing up. It's kind of like an, they're impulsive. And anything in their environment, they show an exaggerated, impulsive response. In this case, it's social anxiety. Whether it's in the animal world or in the schoolyard, play helps us prepare to cope with life's ups and downs. But the way children play has changed dramatically. A generation ago, it didn't take much to have fun. A piece of rope, a few twigs, Children in the United States now spend less time outdoors than any previous generation. That means four to seven minutes a day of free play outside versus seven and a half hours in front of a screen. And they're missing out on a lot more than just fresh air and exercise. Stuart Brown recognized the vital role of play long before it was a respected area of science. Back then, uh, play was considered trivial, an extravagance that kids didn't really have to have. And slowly, the science and the understanding of play behavior itself has burgeoned over the years. We've begun to see play as a whole very differently. Brown realized the toll that play deprivation can take while investigating the man behind a mass shooting. I was a young professor of psychiatry at the time. We had a really intensive investigation. And as a part of that investigation, which included a three generational review of his family and personal history, we really came across the finding that he didn't play normally. And as a part of our final report, it was the suppression of play and the absence of play meant he was unable to handle properly his violent emotions. So that's what launched me an interest in play. And then I did some formal research in the Texas prison system with homicidal individuals and compared their lives with the lives of matched people. And their play histories are vastly different. Brown went on to review the play backgrounds of more than 6,000 people. They confirmed what he first thought, that having fun is actually a very serious matter. What you find is that it's necessary for a sense of optimism, fulfillment, for a sense of competency, for a sense of an authentic self. These are all components that play produces and many more for the well-being of individuals. I'm very concerned. We have a real crisis. While play deprivation may be only one factor, the World Health Organization says 
the mental health of young people is declining. In Europe, for example, one in five kids is dealing with developmental, emotional, or behavioral problems. One in eight is mentally ill. One of the leading advocates of outdoor play is Canada's Mariana Bussoni. Anna, did you pick that hard one again? She started out as an injury prevention researcher, focusing on children. Oh, Matthias made it up again. But she came to realize safety experts were overlooking something crucial. Part of it was having my own kids. I think that that influences everybody to such a large extent. I actually started to read the literature as a developmental psychologist. What is the role of risk in children's lives? And what I read blew my mind. You had very different disciplines all uh, coming to the same conclusion, that engaging in risk was actually a very important aspect of preventing injuries. It takes a lot of strength, doesn't it, guys? If you think about kids taking risks and engaging in risky play, they're learning how their body works. They're learning what they're comfortable with. They're learning um, how the world works. They're learning very fundamental risk management skills. It used to be common for children to muck about unsupervised doing things that might make their parents gasp. But in the 1980s, children discovered the thrill of video games. Around this same time, adults began to see the outside world as a more ominous place. Playing indoors seemed to be the safer choice. We have smartphones in our hands all the time and we're getting bombarded by these catastrophic and cataclysmic events all the time. Um, so you feel like risk is everywhere. Okay. One of the things that parents are most worried about is their child getting kidnapped by a stranger. The likelihood of getting kidnapped by a stranger is so low that stats aren't kept. And so we have a situation where uh, parents and society has very wonky risk perceptions compared to what the data actually show. Two years ago, Brussoni began a national study into how different neighborhoods affect how much children go outside. This particular study deals with the built environment, right? So how can we include kids in the community, make sure that they're comfortable playing outside wherever it is that they want to go? Um, and there's very specific things that we can do to design a community to, to make kids want to play outside and to make parents feel comfortable letting them play outside. Neve Kelly, an 11-year-old participant, is fitted with a GPS watch and an accelerometer. What you see here is the data from Neve's watch from one of the instances where she would have been playing outside. And the little point that's running around is her activity over that time span. So we've got her here. She's probably at home, and she's just leaving her house. And then she's going off to another bit of green space over here where she's hanging out. Um, and she's exploring quite a bit of that area. She's actually covering a good chunk of her neighborhood and spending time in lots of different types of green space. I think that I like to play more. And if you turn back the centuries, like, not centuries, the years, like 10, 20 years ago, I think I'd fit in more. Um, but I like, I kind of like, I've always liked playing outside. It's the best. It seems the freedom to be active outdoors also frees the imagination. There's a river just over there, and we, there's a fort, and we pretend like we're surviving in the wilderness. And uh, we catch these salmon from the river, and we just pretend they're salmon, but they're actually pine cones. 
We've seen um, a generational shift in our approach to what kids are allowed to do and, and how we parent them. You gotta be really, really, really careful. And so that's where it becomes important to point out, okay, so these are the kinds of limitations that you are putting on your child in order to avoid them, you know, being out on their own. I like playing in bushes, forests, trees, climbing. I love climbing. <laughs> Weigh it between a very, very, very unlikely event versus something that could fundamentally influence your child's health and development. <laughs>
would that look like if architects could build buildings and build everyday environments so that they were imbued with playful learning? Well, we're actually trying that, and it's happening around the world. Norway is a land of dramatic beauty where people have a deep connection to nature. But even here, traditional play has started to decline. Ellen Sandsetter plans to change that one playground at a time. Hello. Hello, how are you, Ellen? I'm fine, how are you, Mariana? She's collaborating with Mariana Brassoni in Canada. I wanted to tell you about uh, our project. And that oh, yeah. we, yeah, and we have uh, now uh, mapped all our childcare centers, uh, both uh, indoor and outdoor environments. Yep, so on all 80 children? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Brissoni and Sandsetter are remodeling playgrounds in eight childcare centers with the goal of making them more thrilling. Playgrounds here uh, started to be changed. Everything was uh, kind of shrunk in a way because they were supposed to be uh, more safe. The new designs will be based on Sandsetter's pioneering research. She was the one who pinpointed the features of what's called risky play. In preschools, we know that one in 10 experience an injury during a year. Uh, and some Norwegians even say that that's uh, too little, that's too few injuries. Sandsetter was one of the first researchers to talk to children about their favorite kinds of play. Preschoolers, like the ones at this outdoor childcare center, offer a perspective that's often forgotten. Usually, if you ask people, where did you like to play or what did you play when you were young? Most of the time they mention being in the outdoors, close to nature. Har du supersko? Da. Det er deilig da. So it's kind of um, interesting that a lot of parents don't let their own children do the same thing. We've had this kind of preschool for many, many years, but the last decade, uh, it's been growing in number. And I think that's more kind of a reaction to a society where a lot of our life is, yeah, we're still spending more time indoors, um, you know, all, all uh, digital uh, devices and t TV and things like that. Play is the most important thing for children. Playing is children's most important way of being, of communicating, and also social skills, being together with other children, problem solving. Play is where they learn. What makes risky play different from other kinds of play is that it is a chance for getting injured. That is probably the thing that we are afraid of too. It includes in uncertainty, maybe something that you are a little bit uh, scared about doing, but still it's testing out their environment and themselves. 
You can look at risky play as a, as a way to habituate your fear. So true play where children naturally engage in climbing and engage in testing their ability to manage heights. They are actually learning how to handle it. Then it's nothing to fear anymore. And then you are not as afraid. Sand Setter's research suggests that risky play might actually help prevent phobias. We see that it's the ones that never got the chance to experience climbing. Those are the ones that are more represented in the population with uh, a phobia for heights. When I started doing this research, uh, I read a lot about risky play and it was also always uh, from the adult's perspective and I wanted to talk to the children. It's really something that they are experts in. The striking thing was that uh, all of them talked about bodily feelings. They usually said it tickles in my tummy, my heart goes like boing, 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 and all of it was very positive, but still they talked about the fear being there or the anxiety being there because they did something that was scary. Their word of it in Norwegian was skummert uh, arti and directly translated to, to English that is scary funny. Sandsetter is part of a growing network of experts advocating for every child's right to take part in risky play. I'm very happy for having parents that allowed me to explore and to climb trees and to jump down from heights and to build things and crawl under things and all those things that children want to do. But time may be running out. Many children are growing up today with parents who have few memories of the pleasures of the outdoors. If they don't have that frame of reference, it's much harder for them to realize what's missing. Because this started in the late 80s, those people are now parents. And we could have a collective intergenerational kind of memory fog that wipes out that idea as kind of a normal part of childhood. Traditionally, kids were let free, uh, particularly elementary school age kids, whereas now there isn't a sense of that sense of freedom. And I think with that, there's a huge loss. A return to more outdoor play would reconnect us to one of the most significant aspects of our animal nature. It also promises to restore the emotional benefits that we've only begun to recognize as they're slipping away. We have an industrial revolution background where productivity and uh, being honored and loved for your personal productivity is more important than your happiness or your fulfillment. So I think we've got an uphill fight to get play into the consciousness of the culture. When I'm engaging in play or I watch children engaging in play or I watch a, a kitten engaging in play, I think to myself, you know, this is this is not just fluff. This is something that this animal has evolved to do that serves some purpose that is a rather significant component of this thing's life. When you protect children from every possible danger, they're not going to be very resilient or very able to cope. Just like animals have to be prepared to deal with uncertainties, so do people. All mammals have basically the same brain structure. We've now made the connection that lack of peer play translates into a not normally developed prefrontal cortex. So now all of a sudden you look at the kid scenario and you go, well, if it's true on rats, maybe those correlations in children are in fact causal. 
And my concern has always been, is this a good thing to prevent young children from freely choosing to engage in whatever kind of play they want with their peers? Play is more important now than it has ever been. But in a world where information is doubling every two and a half years, we need critical thinkers, we need creative innovators, and we need children who have the confidence to learn from failure and to persevere so that they create new things. And I think play, the sandbox, incorporates all of these. The most important thing we can do is just get out of the way and let them play. Let them play how they choose, provide uh, an, an environment they feel comfortable playing with, and then just get out of the way. And let them figure it out for themselves. They'll amaze you.